Welcome back. This is the module three of the Introduction to Networks by Cisco lecture series. Today, we're gonna to learn about protocols and models. The objective of this particular lecture is that we're gonna learn about how the network protocols work and enable devices to access local and remote network resources. We're gonna learn about rules, which describe the types of rules that are necessary to communicate, the protocols, which explain why protocols are needed, the protocol suits, which explain purpose of adhering to a specific set of protocols instead of having random ones, standard organizations, uh, which uh, will give you an idea about the roles they play in making sure these protocols are adhered by multiple different companies, the reference models, uh, which explain how the TCP IC, uh, IP models uh, and um, the ISO models are being used and standardizing the communication processes. Data encapsulation. Uh, we will give you a quick overview of how uh, data encapsulation uh, allow us to uh, you know transport data across a network. Data access, which explain how local hosts can ac uh, access uh, resources on a network. In addition to the Cisco uh, particular slide set, I have added some additional uh, slides explaining uh, OSI model uh, so that uh, you'll have a better idea about uh, how that works. The first thing we're gonna learn is the rules. There is a video posted on my YouTube channel uh, that is directly coming from Cisco and that video will explain the protocols that devices use to see their place in the network and communicate with each other. It is called the devices in a bubble. And I will leave a link below. And just to keep this particular presentation short, uh, I will not include the video within this presentation, but you can check, uh, check it out uh, in the video description. And this is the link for it. Uh, if you do not have access to your NetAcad account or you do not have the registered, uh, uh, you know, you haven't registered for a classes with NetAcad or an academic institution, you can still watch that video uh, through this link. And I will leave a, a link in the description. Assuming that you have watched that video, now you have a slight idea about how, you know, the devices communicate in within a network. And let's look at communication fundamentals. Network can vary in size and complexity. For example, if you have a home network, that may be a small network, but if you have a small office network, it may be a little bit more complex with the network printers. And if you have a, a corporate network, you will have hundreds of people within that network. It is not enough to have connection devices, uh, you know, that must agree on, but it, it also needs to agree on how they communicate. It's not just devices need a connection to the network, but it also need to agree on how they communicate. For example, if you and I decided to communicate in English, but then you decided to switch to French or Spanish, uh, the and if I don't understand that language, I cannot communicate with you because the communication will break down, right? So just like that, we agree that we're going to continue this presentation in English because I understand English and you understand English. So that's an example of how we agree to a specific method of communication. So there are three elements to any type of that communication, whether it's a, a computer network system, even, you know, humans, right? But in this particular case, we are looking at the three uh, elements associated with network systems communications. So they are source or the sender. There will be a destination or a receiver. And there will be a channel or a media that provides for the path of communications to occur. So let's look at communications protocols. All communications are governed by protocols. Protocols are rules that are communications follow. Uh, sorry, communications can follow through. And these uh, rules will vary depending on the protocol. So for example, you have a message and that needs to go into a destination. 
and how it's going to work is message going to be going through a signal which is called a transmitter and then the transmitter medium and then then the receiver going to get that signal on their end and then it goes into the destination so when the ma- message was sent from the source it can reach all the way to the destination the rules of establishment individuals must use an established rules or agreements to govern the conversation just like we are using english like i mentioned before if you are speaking in french and i'm giving this presentation in english our communication going to break down right so the first message in this particular example um is showing the similar uh breakdown in communication but even though they are using the same language so for example the first message is difficult to read because it is not formatted properly the second message shows properly formatted so even though in this scenario unlike my example uh, where you speaking french i speak in english in this scenario both are speaking in english sending the message in english but the formatting is different because this formatting is really difficult to, uh, to understand at the top the communication the rules of establishment here is pretty bad but here the established rules are much better because now you can read that english text that been communicated so the protocols must account for the following requirements an identified sender and a receiver a common language and grammar for example english and a proper formatting not just english but also formatting speed and timing of the delivery so that the messages won't get clash or get lost in the network confirmation or acknowledgement of that message network protocol requirements uh, include uh, the common computer protocols that must be in agreements and have to have certain uh, pro- uh, protocols in place in order for them to communicate with each other such as message encoding message formatting and encapsulation message size message timing and message delivery options and we will look at each one of these options within uh, the next few slides so the first thing we're going to look at is the message encoding the encoding is the process of converting information into another acceptable form of transmission decoding reverses this process to intercept uh, sorry interpret uh, the information so how it works is the encoding process will take the message from the source and encode it in this case as an email for example and it can, so that it can be transmitted through these layers these different uh, you know sections and then can be received by the destination and on the destination side the it you will have an interpret uh, like some kind of interpreter that will allow to uh, the uh, say receiver to receive that information and interpret that data and so that they can read it for example an email we have like different proper protocols such as pop uh, where you know it get encoded and then when you receive it uh, the email client on this end will decode the message so that the person on this end can read it so the message formatting and encapsulation uh, so when a message is sent it must use specific formats or structure message formats depending on the type of message like depend on the type of message and the channel it is used to deliver the message so like for example if you are sending an email it will have that specific email uh, you know message format like i said like pop or smtp things like that and um, if you're sending a letter that's going to be a paper and a pencil right or paper or a, and a pen it's going to be a physical message and if it is a website you post something onto the website or social media or something like that is the protocol going to be http or https for example port 80 or port 443 uh, or something like that so that means they are using specific protocols to communicate so when you send an email for example it has these data packets that have encapsulated your information so that can be transmitted through a network so 
we will go into depth of you know uh, the how the data uh, packets work and but on the right hand side here you can see you know the, this this first byte include the version and traffic part of the traffic and class and the second byte include part of the traffic and class and the flow uh, flow label and then the you know third and fourth byte includes the flow label at the top uh, of this structure and on underneath you have the destination ip the source ip remember the destination and source you need to have that information and then you have the payload length next header and hop limit and we will talk about these things in detail on our future um, lectures but for just for now just remember when you send an email or a message it get encapsulated and those are put into packets like these with all this data information within it within that packet and being sent from the uh, the sender to the receiver and let's look at the message size so encoding between host must be in an appropriate format for the medium the messages sent across the network are converted to bits and the bits are encoded into patterns of light sound or electrical impulses and then the destination host must decode the signal to interpret the message so how it's going to work is you send an email and it get encoded and it get converted into either light sound or electrical pulses so light for example if you have fiber optic channels or fiber optic internet networks it will be converted into those light pulses and that gets sent across the cable or cables of uh, fi optical fibers to the destination and electrical impulses are used by, by your cat5 and cat6 uh, you know wired cables so that you can grab that encapsulated data uh, for, uh, that is being traveled across uh, traveling through the network then at the end when you have received that information on your end uh, you know you can use a so uh, you know for an email software for example or a online uh, email like gmail uh, to decode that message and so that you can be you, you can read that message that you just received the message timing the message timing includes the following the flow control response timeout and access method the flow control manages the rate of data transmission and define how much information can be sent and the speed at which it can be delivered it ensures that the packets are not dropped because too much data is being sent too quickly so for example if you are sending a 1 gigabyte file uh, across a, a, a http s or ftp uh, protocol uh, so let's say it's a ftp protocol uh, sending too much of that one gigabyte file uh, packets could clash or drop packets and then could result in a corrupt download on the other side so the flow control makes sure that the data corruption during transmission uh, would not occur response time manages how long a device waits when it does not hear a reply back from the destination so that means when you send a message it needs to have an acknowledgement and when that acknowledgement doesn't receive the response will well, you know it will wait for it and it will have a response timeout you probably seen those response timeout uh, uh, messages and error messages when you sometimes visit websites uh, uh, with uh, you know too many people trying to access it like for especially like um, I remember when the Samsung or some uh, Apple when they were launching their new phones uh, sometimes uh, you will get an error message say on the day of the uh, the launch saying uh, the website has a response timeout that because of there are too many requests going into the server and be, it can handle everything so it will result in that you know um, waiting for that particular response to come back when it doesn't hear it and it will give you a response timeout and the access method the access method determines when someone can send a message there may be various rules governing issues like collisions this is when more than one device sends traffic at the same time and messages become corrupt uh, access method and the response timeout typically work together actually all of these three flow control response timeout and access method work together in terms of controlling the message timing and in access control also some protocols are 
uh, proactive and attempt to prevent collisions and some other protocols are reactive and establish a recovery method after a collision occurs. And again, we will go into much more detail on flow control, response timeout, access method, and how they work together uh, in terms of message timing in our future videos and future lectures. But for now, just remember for this course that you know there are three uh, sections in message timing, which is flow control, response timeout, and, ac and access method. The message delivery options include unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So these three options are used by networks to communicate with other devices. It could be intermediary devices, such as switches and routers, or it could be uh, end devices, such as a, a computer or a laptop. Broadcasts are used in IPv4 networks, uh, but uh, are not an option in IPv6. And again, we will talk about that in depth in a different video and a different lecture series. What you need to remember is a unicast is one-to-one -one communication. Multicast is one-to-many, but typically not all. Broadcast is one to all. To better understand this, uh, you can look at the three pictures on the bottom. So if it is unicast, what's gonna happen is the source gonna send a message and the packet goes to that exact same destina destination that is targeted. In multicast, what's gonna happen is packet, uh, the, the source send a message and that packet is sent to multiple destinations. In broadcast, how it works is the source send a, mes send a message and then it will go to multi all the devices attached to that particular um, intermediary device, in this case, switch. An example of a broadcast, for example, is the uh, DSCP request. So if this is guy is just connected to the network and that might send out a broadcast uh, to everybody looking for a DSCP uh, server. So the first DSCP server to respond back will hand out the DSCP to the source. So again, we are not gonna talk about that in this particular lecture, but we will talk about it in the future. Just remember, unicast is sending one-to-one, -one, multicast is one-to-many, and the broadcast is one-to-all. Just a quick note on this particular documentation uh, from Cisco. Uh, documents uh, in this particular lecture series may use uh, these kind of dots. Um, so to icons with circles, which represent devices. And uh, the figures right here is shows uh, the illustration of how these delivery options are demonstrated in this particular lecture series. So this is not like a universal thing or anything, but it's just showing like, you know, how the unicast, multicast and broadcast work. See, but the broadcast goes into every single device, multicast, selected devices, unigas, it's just one-to-one. -one. And these yellow dots basically doesn't receive that message that originated from these red dots. So you can look at this slide, uh, you can pause this video and look at this slide to understand if you wanna wrap your head around it, how each of these different um, systems work. Next, we will look at protocols. So what is the definition of a protocol? A protocol is a set of rules to ensure successful host-to-host -host communication. This slide is not in your Cisco uh, manual or uh, your documentations. If you are registered for this course with your academic institution, this is something that we added. So just to highlight, you need to remember the protocol is a set of rules to ensure successful host-to-host -host communication. So to just to give you an idea about network protocols uh, that we use. Um, so a network protocols define a common set of rules. It can be implemented uh, on devices in software, hardware, or both. And protocols must have their own function, format, and rules. So for example, uh, like right here, we have like a type of, um, uh, you know, protocol type, for example, network communication. It enables two or more devices to communicate over one or more networks. Network security is secure data to provide authentication, data integrity, and uh, the encryption. Routing, uh, which enables routers to exchange route information 
uh, compare path information and select best path. Device discovery, which use uh, for uh, the automatic de detection uh, of devices or services. What you need to remember is that network uh, protocols have, you know, set of rules, and that's what make it a protocol and agree upon rules. So that's what really important in this slide that you need to remember. Network protocol functions. Devices use agreed upon protocols to communicate with each other. For example, if I'm speaking in, in English and you have to agree to speak in English, otherwise we're gonna you know, mistranslate and miscommunicate and the communication gonna fail. So there's agree upon language. Just like that, there's the, the network protocols have agreed upon protocols to communicate so that they can understand each other. Protocols may have one or uh, more functions associated with that particular protocol. So, for example, with the, uh, in this table, there's a little bit of description about uh, some protocols that may be in use, such as addressing, which identify the sender and the receiver, reliability, which provide you know guaranteed delivery, flow control, which ensure the data flows at an efficient rate, Se sequencing, which uniquely labels each transmitted segment of data. Error detection, which, de which determines if data become corrupted during transmission. Application interface, which process, so, so I mean application interface is the process to process communication between network applications. And those are all, all of these functions can be part of the uh, protocol functions. Network requires the use of several protocols, uh, not just one. So each protocol has its own function and format. In this example, they were looking at an email, which has a HTTP, TCP, IP, and Ethernet. And the HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol governs the way a web server and a web client interact with each other. If you are using, for example, webmail, and it defines the content and format. The transmission protocol or TCP manages the individual conversations, provide guaranteed delivery, and manages flow control. The IP or internet protocol delivers messages globally from the sender to the receiver. So that means the sender could be anywhere in the world, and as long as they have agreed upon, uh, you know, the stack right here, and it will be able to receive by the uh, receiver on the other end anywhere in the world. The Ethernet delivers the message from the network interface card or NIC to another network interface card on the same Ethernet local area network. We're going to look at uh, protocol suits. Um, so protocols must be able to work with other protocols. And that's where the protocol suits come from. A group of, so basically we can define that as a group of interrelated protocols necessary to perform a communication function. It sets a, a set of rules that work together to help solve a problem. The protocols are viewed in terms of layers like the higher layer and lower layers. The lower layers are concerned with moving data and provide services to upper layers that uh, in the higher levels. Like for example, uh, the, in this case that, you know, we have a content layer uh, and there's rules and physical layer. And then content layer uh, it would be like, you know, where is the cafe, right? That's the content, that's the message. And then the rules going to be use common language, wait your turn, and signal when it is finished. So the person on this end will say, where is the cafe? And we know it is trans, the rule is it is in English. And we know the next person going to answer after I finish my sentence and they have received the information. And when the next person can respond back saying the cafe is at... Uh, Edmonton, Alberta, for example, and then that get transmitted back uh, to the uh, the sender, and the sender can understand because both of them use the like I said the common language, 
they wait for each other's turn and uh, they can communicate without a clash because of these protocols that being used. That's just a simple example. I keep going back to the language and the communication. So the evolution of uh, protocol suits. Uh, there are several protocols uh, used in the network uh, engineering industry. Uh, the Internet Protocol Suite or TCP IP is the most common protocol suite uh, and maintained by the Internet Engineering Task Force or IETF. And the other one is the Open Systems Interconnection or OSI protocols, which is developed by the International Organization for Standardization or ISO and the Union, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, and the International Communications Union, ITU. And there are other uh, proprietary uh, protocols such as Apple Talk, uh, which is the proprietary suite uh, developed by the Apple, uh, and Naval uh, Netware, which is proprietary suite developed by the Naval Link, for example. But what you need to understand is there are different types of protocol suites, and we uh, mostly use uh, commonly the TCP IP or the OSI model. And on the right hand side, uh, you have an idea about these different types of protocols and how they are divided. The TCP IP have like HTTP, DNS, DSCP, FTP types like, you know, those protocols on the application layer. Then we have the transport layer with the TCP uh, and UDP and we have the other, uh, you know, in here. And then we have the network access down here. And the ISO model also broken down into different uh, categories like that here and that Apple Talk and now. We will talk in depth of a little bit of our TCP IP and a lot about the ISO uh, model uh, on next future next few slides, uh, so that you can have a better idea about uh, you know how ISO model and TCP IP work. So it's coming up uh, in next few minutes. So the TCP IP protocol. TCP IP protocols operate at the application, transport, and internet layers. The most common network access layer, LAN protocols are, uh, um, you know, the LAN protocols uh, use the Ethernet and the WAN, uh, sorry, WLAN, sorry, WLAN, which is the wireless LAN uh, uses that kind of uh, uh, protocol, the TCP IP protocol. So how LAN and uh, WLAN work is that they use the TCP IP uh, where uh, the application layer have the HTTP, uh, like for example, your web access, and the transport layer has a transmission con uh, control protocol, which is a TCP, that's where the TCP came from. And then we have the internet uh, layer, which has the IP, that's where that IP come from here, TCP IP. And finally, we have the network access, which is the ethernet. So the ethernet case is like the physical cable, and then you have the the internet protocol just after that, and then the transmission control protocol used for transmission, TCP on top of that. And then we have the HTTP, which is the application layer that communicate to the uh, the end user. So it could be a website access, for example, which using HTTP, and that's where the TCP IP come from. And it is still in use, and it is used by the network uh, systems to communicate with each other using the TCP IP protocol method. So the TCP IP protocol suit is uh, used by the internet uh, and also in use some other uh, protocols uh, along with it. TCP IP is an open standard protocol uh, that is freely available uh, to public and can be used by vendors. Uh, it's a protocol suit, not just a protocol. And um, a standard uh, base uh, protocol uh, suit that is endorsed by the networking industry and provided by a standardized organization to make sure interoperability. For example, if a Cisco made a switch and then a D-Link made another switch, I can put the Cisco switch and D-Link switch in the same uh, networking environment. They should be able to communicate with each other, no problem, because we have these standardized TCP IP protocols uh, you know, built into it, for example. So TCP IP layers are described, at, described as application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and network access layer. And under the application layer, uh, we have multiple protocols included within it. And then like multi multiple things included within it, such as DNS. 
And in this diagram, it basically explains how TCP IP uh, use uh, part of these layers uh, to communicate. For example, in here, application layer, transport layer, and internet layer is the, what we call the TCP IP protocols. So you just can come back to this slide or post this video to look at it. And you should know these breakdowns, but not so much uh, the details within it. Like you should know what a POP3 or SMTP does, like what kind of layer that associated with, uh, so that you, you, know, you can answer some of the questions on the Cisco exams. So they might ask you like, okay, you have a FTP uh, and what layer that is falls under under TCP IP model, it will be the application, for example. So you have, you know, TCP and where does it, which layer is, it falls under? Well, it, it falls under the transport layer. So you should know that. So I'm just giving you a hint about like future exams, but just for now, just remember, you know, it, the breakdown here. A web server encapsulating and sending a web page to a client can use the TCP IP communication process. And in modern day, that's what exactly happening. So it includes the ethernet, the IP, the TCP, the data. And that packet's being sent to the web client when it requests that page from the web server. A client de-encapsulate the web page for the web browser. So your web browser such as Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, uh, you know, uh, Firefox, uh, Firefox, what they do is actually using that data packet that being sent by the server and de-encapsulating so you can read it. So next thing we're gonna look at is the standards organizations such as like IEEE, um, you know, ITA and et cetera, et cetera. So there are several open standards. The open standards encourage interoperability between different uh, manufacturers such as Cisco, D-Link, et cetera, et cetera. It encourage competition and it, it grows innovation. Standard organizations are vendor neutral Typically non-profit organizations, but there are some uh, for-profit standardization organizations as well. Uh, it established to develop and promote the concept of open standards. The internet standards are made by several different of those organizations. One of them is the Internet Society or ISOC which promotes the open development and evolution of the internet. The other one is the Internet Architecture Board, AI, uh, sorry, IAB, which is under that internet uh, um, you know, society, which is responsible for the management and development of internet standards. The Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, develops, updates, and maintains internet and TCP IP technologies. The Internet Research Task Force or IRTF focus on long-term research related to internet and TCP IP protocols. So you can understand how this works in a visual way if you look at the right-hand side, sorry, left-hand side uh, diagram here. And uh, just remember, you know, that these organi separate organizations respons responsible for standardizing the internet. Next, we're gonna look at um, some other, uh, you know, organizations that involve in the development and support of the TCP IP. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, for example, ICANN, they coordinate the IP address allocation, the management of domain names, and assignment of other information. For example, when you visit sanuja.com or sanuja.ca, my website, the sanuja.com is registered with the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They are the one who is actually assigning sanuja.com to my web server, and then my web server associates its HTTPS IP address to that sanuja.com name, so that when you type sanuja.com on the website, it pulls my uh, website from that IP address. 
The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority or IANA oversees, the man uh, oversees and manages the IP addresses allocation, domain name management and protocol uh, identifiers for that ICANN uh, up here. So again, you can look at the uh, left-hand side diagram and you can get a better idea about uh, you know how it, it being operated. So we have ICANN here and then you have IANA here and then, then they get, you know, uh, they control together all of these items. Just remember this for the exam because that uh, that do show up on uh, Cisco exams, you know, how it been handled. Electronic and communication standards. Um, there are multiple different standards, so we're going to look at some of them. So Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, so IEEE, uh, dedicated to creating standards in power and energy, healthcare, telecommunications and networking. Electronic Industries Alliance, or IEA, uh, EIA, develop standards relating to electrical wiring, connections, uh, and the 19th, uh, sorry, 19-inch racks uh, used to mount networking equipment, like, you know, the network racks, for example. Uh, there's a particular standard so that, we, for example, if you have a network, uh, a, a rack-mountable server do, uh, built by IBM, you can... Uh, put that server in the same rack as a rack mountable server built by uh, HP, for example. The Telecommunication Industry uh, Association or TIA develops communication standards in radio equipment, cellular towers, voice over uh, IP, VoIP devices, satellite communication devices, and more. Uh, they make sure that, for example, cell towers are compatible, like the 3G standard and 5G standard, for example. Uh, the International Telecommunications Union. Te telecommunication standards uh, sector or ITU-T define the standards for video compression, internet protocol television or IPTV, and broadband communication such as digital subscriber lines such as DSL and ADSL. I will not uh, look at the lab uh, in this particular video, uh, but I will do a lab in a you know separate. Uh, video but if you are registered for these classes with the Cisco again you should be able to access your lab through your registered course material uh, either through Cisco or your academic institution. So let's look at reference models. The benefits of using a layered model is that a complex concepts such as how a network operates can be difficult to explain and understand by just using words. So using a model, you can actually demonstrate the same information, but with a much clear, uh, you know, diagrams. So two layers models describe uh, operation, network operations, the open system interconnection or OSI model, uh, and the other one is TCP IP model. On your left hand side on your screen, you can see the OSI model and it shows the application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. And on the TCP IP model, we have the application, transport, network, and network access. And in terms of protocol suits, uh, we have the DSC, sorry, um, yeah, DSCP, HTTP, DNS, FTP at the, at the, at the top here, and the TCP IP uh, in the uh, transport section. IPv4, IPv6, ICMP and ICMPv6 on the network section and Ethernet, WLAN, Sonnet and you know SDH, things like that on the, the bottom section. Some of these um, protocol suites uh, overlaps uh, between different layers of the models, like for example, the in OSI model, the data link and physical overlap uh, the uh, Ethernet, uh, WAN and Sonnet and in um, TCP IP, they just use a one single one as a network access. So these are like different way of representing it. So that's in different models. And we will talk about especially the OSI model uh, in this particular lecture series as we move forward. So the benefits of using a, a layered model is that uh, there are, you know, uh, multiple benefits like it assists in protocol design because the protocols that operates at a specific layer have a defined set of rules 
and information that they act upon and define interface to the layers above and below. So what that actually means is without looking, it's going to be hard to uh, understand. What it means is like if this transport layer has set of rules, so that means it can be easy to communicate between network layer and session layer. And it's easy to communicate between application layer and the internet layer. That's what that basically means. It fosters competition because products from different vendors, as I mentioned multiple times, can work together. It prevents technology or uh, capability changes in one layer from affecting the other layers or above. So as the technology or capability changes in the one single layer, you know, it should, you know, it shouldn't affect the other layers above or below. It provides a common language to describe networking functions and capabilities. We keep coming back to that common language, remember? So, you know, it, it makes sure everything is standardized so it can communicate uh, with um, each other. Let's look at the OSI reference model. This is the model that in this particular course we'll be paying a lot of attention to, but we will also look into TCP IP, but we will spend more time looking at this OSI model than the TCP IP. So the OSI model has uh, seven layers. At the very top, we have the application layer. Then we have the presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer and physical layer. For this Cisco class, it is very important you understand these layers. I actually would act memorize how these layers are stacked on top of each other. Not only you need to understand these layers, but also sometimes you need a little bit of memorization so that you, on, during an exam, you can recall uh, where these uh, um, uh, you know, layers uh, come into play. The application layer contains protocols used for peer to, sorry, uh, to process uh, the communications. The, the presentation layer provides for common uh, representation of data transferred between application layers uh, services. Session layer provides the services to presentation layer and to manage data exchange and transport layer defines services to segment transfer and reassemble the data for individual communications and the network layer provides services to exchange the individual pieces of data over the network and the data layer describe methods for exchanging data uh, frames over a common media and the physical layer basically wires and you know it describe and the network cards which describe the mean to, uh, to activate maintain or deactivate physical connections so you know how your network interface card works um, comes down to the physical layer i went through this slide really fast and i just quickly read them because Next few slides, I will go on each one of these OSI model layers and explain a little bit in depth. Uh, however, that is not part of the the uh, standardized Cisco uh, um, course um, course we are set. Um, this is some extra extra slides that I have added to enhance uh, this lecture. So let's go ahead and look at the OSI model. So OSI model. Uh, Remember, we have seven uh, layers, and we're gonna look at how uh, you know how important the OSI layer to us. So it is a seven-layer model that will conceptualize the data communication. It is developed by ISO in 1984. Uh, you don't really need to know the exact date or a year that was. Uh, developed but you should know it's around 1980s and it describes standards for intercomputer communication it helps you break down network uh, functions and also uh, it helps you troubleshoot issues it creates standards for equipment manufacturing such as Cisco D-Link and other manufacturers uh, who would be using these OSI models to make sure interoperability and it allows uh, vendors to focus in specialized areas of network. Uh, uh, for example, Cisco would make a intermediary devices such as a switch or a router, and then D-Link may make a, a you know end device such as a like IP camera, for example. So the application layer, the very top layer, it is the interface, uh, you know that used by the applications you can look at it that way 
so there are interfaces such as uh, you know HTTP, FTP, for example. So they are used by that application layer, and it provide network access to applications, such as your FTP client or your Google Chrome. When you access uh, you know Google Chrome uh, and you access my website, for example, sanuj.com, it is using using HTTPS to access uh, that data. So you uh, to, to your you know Google Chrome uh, you know Google Chrome uh, browser, which is the application which is operating in the application layer. So I'm going to repeat that again. Your Google Chrome browser, when you access like sanuja.com, is using the application layer to access that data. Next, we're going to look at the presentation layer, which is this layer, which is used for data formatting such as HTML, JPEG, or MP3. So if you visit my website and then you visit cbc.ca or uh, canada.ca, they're all using the same data formatting, HTML data formatting, which is standardized in the presentation layer. It uses encryption services for online banking, for example, uh, like HTTPS uh, uh, secure shells. And it uses data compression. And the next layer is the session layer, which is layer number five, which controls the dialogue between computers and starts and ends sessions. And the session layers can keep uh, sessions separate so that it doesn't have uh, data clashes or like uh, corruption. So just remember these items for now, and we will go into depth uh, later on in this series, but you need to remember this for your quizzes. So next one is the transport layer, which is layer number four, is this one. So it describes how data is sent. So reliably, uh, reliably or unreliably. For example, TCP uh, is uh, reliable, uh, UDP is not. So for example, when you are viewing this video from YouTube, it is using UDP. But if you are using, you know, wipe communication, they're probably going to use TCP because you can have some packets drop during buffering, but you still, you know, you still be able to uh, be able to enjoy the video because it can put together in advance, for example. So well known. Uh, so you should be able to define well known services that use TCP and UDP in the transport layer and the port numbers associated with it, firewalls, for example, uh, typically operate in this transport layer, layer number four. And it also can be used for controlling size and the rate of the message, which is the segment. Uh, it not can be like it is being used for controlling, you know, uh, the size and the rate of the message and segment. And again, for now, for in this particular uh, presentation, I will not go into depth of these things, but I will talk about how transport layer and this are different UD TCP and UDP applications and port numbers in our future lectures. But for now, just remember, the transport layer is responsible for how data is sent, and it includes that the TCP, UDP stuff, uh, and um, sys uh, the, uh, um, devices such as firewalls use that transport layer to operate. And again, in terms of understanding, you know, well-known services, only thing you need to remember is the basic stuff. I will leave a link below on uh, the description of this video of the port numbers that you must remember for this class, for this particular courses, if you are taking through either Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. Typical ports you need to remember is like port 80 and 443 for web services. Uh, POP3 uses port 440 or 995, and SMTP for emails use port uh, 5 or uh, I believe port uh, 587. So all of these things, um, I will put a link in the description so that you can study that in depth. And again, I will talk about this in the future in a different video. So the next one is the network layer, which is the layer number three. It is known as the logical addressing layer because that's the layer that contain the IP addresses and it find the best path to a destination. And network layer is a layer which the routers operate. So that is a very important concept that you should remember. The routers operate at the network layer. Uh, 
And the next one is the data link layer, which is a layer number two, bottom, uh, just be below bottom uh, layer. Uh, and it is known as a physical addressing layer. That's where the MAC address contain. So that is a distinction between network layer and data link layer. So the network layer include the IP address and the data link includes the MAC address. And it, it ensures the data is error free and uh, devices such as switches operate in the data link layer. So the routers in network layer, data link layer has switches. Except you will learn something called layer three switches, which actually operate in the network layer, but we will not look at that right now for now, but I will explain how that works in the future. And finally, the most, uh, you know, uh, bottom layer, which is the layer number one, which is the physical layer, which provides access to the cable, electrical signals, ones and zeros, and so that it can communicate between different devices. It also includes the media itself, such as whether you're gonna use fiber optics or whether you're gonna use like uh, electrical wires um, uh, to communicate uh, with each other. So that is a very important, uh, uh, thing that you should remember. That's why I added these slides. These are not part of your Cisco lectures that you get from directly from Cisco. This is something that uh, I have added so that you can have a better idea. So now we're gonna look at the TCP IP reference model quickly, but we will not uh, go into that, kind of, uh, that depth, um, but I will use just what the Cisco has for uh, students. Uh, so the TCP IP model have the tra application, transport, internet, and network access. I'm not gonna uh, talk much on this slide because we already uh, did discuss that a little bit. Um, so the reference models we use is the OSI model and TCP IP model. So in comparison, uh, this is what you need to remember just, you know, it's, it's different, but for this particular course, what's really important is OSI model, but you should also should know uh, the TCP IP model. Uh, you can uh, read what it says on this previous slide if you have to have if you would like to get a better understanding of uh, what those layers on TCP IP model. The OSI model divides the network access layer and the application layer of the TCP IP model into multiple layers. Remember that, and the TCP IP model. Uh, you know, it does not uh, specify which protocol to use uh, when transmitting over a physical medium, but the OSI model does. The OSI layers one and layer two discuss the necessary procedures to access the media and the physical means to send data over a network. So these are the three items that you should remember for your exams and quizzes. And um, Packet tracer, uh, there is a packet tracer simulation activity in the NetAcad uh, that you should be working on uh, so that you can understand all of these layers and how it works. I will not show that in this particular video, but in the future I will make a video on this particular packet tracer, uh, TCP IP and OSI model investigation. It's a really cool um, de demo and a lab. If you have access to those, do it right now. If not, I will post a link in the future. Now we're gonna look at the data encapsulation. The data en encapsulation basically makes sure that the messages can be transmitted through a network uh, while uh, when the sender send that information across uh, a medium to the destination. So let's look at the segmenting messages in the data encapsulation process. So segmenting is the process of breaking up messages into smaller units. Multiplexing is the process of taking multiple streams of segmented data and interlevering them together. Segmenting messages have two primary benefits. It increases the speed and it increases the efficiency. It increases speed because large amounts of data can be sent over the network without tying up a communications link. It increases efficiency because only segments which fail to reach the destination needed to be retransmitted, not the entire data stream because of the segmentation nature. So if you segment a message, for example, and only part of the message didn't reach here, 
you only had to send that one single segment that has not been reached not the entire message another uh, thing in encapsulation is sequencing sequencing messages is the process of numbering segments so that the message can be reassembled at the destination tcp is responsible for sequencing the individual segments so for example if this guy send a message and it has three two one by labeling that message with yellow three two one the server knows that they not to mix this one with this two and this two with this three instead it, it's gonna make sure that it's gonna put together yellow two, one yellow two yellow three and yellow uh, you know orange one two threes etc etc so labeling provide the ordering and assembling of pieces when they arrive uh, even when it is arriving from different destination at the same time or jumble up together you know mixed up together protocol data units encapsulation is a process where protocols added uh, sorry protocols add their information to the data at each stage of the process a pdu has a different name to reflect its functions i know it can be a little bit confusing and i will explain that later so the pdu or the protocol data units um you know you it has a different name to reflect its new functions when things change during the transmission so there is no universal naming convention for pdus uh, uh, in this course, uh, the PDUs are named according to the protocols of the TCP IP model or the suit, and the PDUs uh, passing down the stacks, um, you know, can be described uh, as follows. So you can look at this uh, right here on the right hand bottom corner. Uh, in this course, this is how we're going to look at the PDUs. So, for example, layer seven in the OSI model. Uh, we, uh, the PDU is the data, and layer 6 is data, and layer 5 is data, and then layer 4 is segment, layer 3 is packet, layer 2 is frame, and layer 1 is the physical or the bits. And again, just remember, you know, we we will be using the OSI model, and this is what how we're going to do it in this particular course to understand uh, network engineering concepts. Uh, but... Yeah, PDU are still important. You know, it is it is in part of the data encapsulation. And uh, an example of a data encapsulation uh, is uh, the, uh, the the it is a top down uh, process. Uh, the level about does its process and then pass it down to the next level of the model. And this process is repeated by each layer until it is sent out as a bit stream. So that's very important. So that basically it takes that, you know, data and then it's processing it in each layer and putting it into the next layer and the next layer and next layer and next layer until that, you know, it reached the, you know, top of that layer. For example, the physical layer, take the data and put and do its work and give it to this layer, do its work, give it to this layer, do its work, give it to this layer until it's reached the top of that stack. And then it can be transmitted uh, through a network in this case like for example a web server to the end client like you are viewing this video for example the de encapsulation and uh, kind of does the opposite it is actually do the opposite so it is data is de encapsulated as it moves up the stack when a layer completes its process the layer that that layer strips off its header and pass it up to the next level uh, to be processed uh, I will explain what are headers and how it works in a different or, a, you know, in a detail later. Uh, this is repeated at each layer until it is a data stream that the application can process. So in, you know, in here, like, you know, that 10101 bits get, you know, de-encapsulated so that this system can read it. So it receives uh, as bits, like a stream of bits. And then it break down to frame, packet, segment, and data. So et cetera, et cetera. The interaction of protocols. The application protocol uh, includes things like hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, 
The transport protocol includes, as I mentioned, multiple times TCP or you know UDP, for example. Uh, the internet protocol is the internet protocols, uh, which is such as IP, and um, the network access protocols, uh, and you know the data link that includes the data link and physical layers. So interaction between them, you can look at it like this way on the shown on the right hand side. So the Ethernet, IP, TCP, and HTTP. I know some of these diagrams and informations are being slightly repeated, uh, but that's how the Cisco courses are set up. And because these concepts are very important for someone who is new to network engineering, uh, you know, in order for uh, you to understand m much more complex uh, in, uh, you know, on, our, on my future videos. So it's very important you understand the OSI model and these concepts. And so that's why the information being slightly repeated right now. So we're going we're gonna to look at the data access um, layer. So data access include addresses. Uh, both the data link and the network layers uh, use addressing to deliver data from source to destination. Network layer source and destination addresses are responsible for delivering the IP packet from original source to the final destination. The data link layer source and destination address are responsible for delivering the data link frame from one network interface or network interface card NIC to the next another NIC on the same network. So you have the physical layer, which has a timing and synchronization bits. Data link layer has the destination and source physical address. Network layer has the destination and source logical network address. And then the transport layer has the destination and source address or the port numbers. And finally, the upper layer will have the encoded application data. Uh, this uh, particular slide, you have this uh, nice little diagram. I would actually remember this for your exams and quizzes from Cisco. The layer three logical address. The IP packet contains two IP addresses. The source IP address, which is the IP address of the sending device, original source of the packet, and then the destination IP address which is the IP address of the receiving device or the final destination of the packet. These addresses may be on the same link or remote. And in this diagram on the right hand side, it shows a IP packet being sent and it is going through these routers and reaching the destination. And you have the source IP address and you have the destination IP address. And that's what, you know, being described in this slide. And are we gonna continue this to our uh, next slide. Uh, so an IP address contains uh, two parts. The network portion, which has IPv4, or the prefix, which is in the IPv6. The leftmost part of the address indicates the network group, which the IP address is a member, such as IPv4 or IPv6. Each LAN or WAN will have the same network portion. And then we have the host portion, uh, in IPv4 or interface ID for IPv6, which is the remaining part of the IP address that identifies a specific device within a group. This portion is unique for each device on the network, just like a unique address on a street where you can find the house by using that address, you can find the device using the IP address. And on the right hand side, uh, we are using the same diagram uh, showing that similar information. Devices on the same network in uh, will have like different IP addresses and different MAC addresses, for example. So when the devices are on the same network, the source address and the destination uh, will have the same number in network portion of the address, but however different uh, you know, last octet. Like for example, this PC one will have 192.168.1, but also FTP server will have 192.168.1. But the last part of the octet is the in, in PC is 110 and the FTP is nine. Uh, some of you guys may have questions why I use the term octet. 
um, uh, we will talk about IP addressing, IPv4 addressing, and subnetting on a different video. But just remember, all of these are like just like octet. Um, and in this video, we will describe uh, some of the IPv4 configuration. But just for now, in a same network, we will have first couple of octet the same, like first three, and the last one would be different. Next, we will look at the role of the data link layer on devices that are on the same network. When a devices are on the same ethernet network, the data link frame will use the actual MAC address of the destination NIC or network interface card. The MAC addresses are physical uh, addresses that are attached to the ethernet uh, NIC and are local use for local addressing. Uh, in the future, I will explain how you can do uh, MAC address spoofing and how you can change it. Uh, but for this particular course, just remember MAC addresses are physical addresses embedded into the uh, physical NIC itself. Even though it can be spoof, spoof or change using some software methods. Um, just for now, they are physical addresses embedded into the physical uh, Ethernet NIC. The source MAC address will be that of the originator on the link. The destination MAC address will always be the same link as the source even if the ultimate destination is remote. So that's how the data link layer uses the same IP. Um, data link layer is being used on the IP addresses on the same network. I will go into details about this on a different video, but just for now, just remember these key points and we will move on to some advanced, uh, you know, in-depth analysis uh, later on. However, when devices are on a remote network, what happens is the actual, in terms of like ultimate destination is not going to be inside that internal LAN network with the same subnet and the IP address, or like a similar IP addresses, right? Similar subnets. So what happened when PC1 tries to reach to the web server? Does this impact the network and data link layer? Well, that's where the network layer addresses comes into play. The role of the network layer addresses are used when the source and the destination have different network portions. This means they are on a different network. For example, in here, the PC1 has 192.168.1.110. So their subnet is in 192.168.1 category and the last octet is 1.110. But however, the destination they try to reach the second octet is and the first octet, everything is different. So this one is 172.16.199. So the this device has 192.168.1.110 and within the same network, another device could have that 192.168.1.1, but this is a completely different network which has 172.16.199. So basically, they're reaching, this PC is reaching a web server that is located outside of the internal network. So that's where the role of the network layer addresses comes into play. And again, I will go into depth in a different video and a different lecture. For this particular lecture, just remember that's where the network layer addresses coming into play. The role of data link layer addresses when we have different IP networks. When the final destination is remote, layer three will provide layer two with the local default gateway IP address, also known as the router address. It's very important you remember that. When the final destination is remote, layer three will provide layer two with the local default gateway IP address also known as the route address. Remember OSI model? We, the different layers, layer one, two, uh, seven. So this is what we are using here. The default gateway or DGW 
is the router interface IP address that is part of this LAN and will be the door or the gateway to all other remote locations. All devices on the LAN must be told about this address or their traffic will be confined to the LAN only. Once the layer 2 on PC1 forward to the default gateway, in other words, this particular PC send that information to the default gateway right here, which is in, on the router on this side of uh, on this side of the router. The router then can start routing process of getting the information to actual destination. So for this PC, the default gateway gonna be right here. So this is just a switch. So it, this PC is connected to a switch, but their default gateway or DGW is right here where there is, there's this orange arrow. The data link addressing is local addressing. So it will have a source and a destination for each link. The MAC addressing for the first segment in this example, the source gonna be a -A 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 and then that's gonna be the PC one and then the destination gonna have those ones, one, 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 one. But the, the destination address, sorry, destination MAC address, which receives the frame is actually the default gateway of that router which is right here. Not while the layer two or L2 local addressing will change from link to link or hop to hop, the L3 addressing, however, layer three addressing remains the same. It does not change. So that's a very important concept. So we are in this data link and this is what they're highlighting on the right hand side up here. And again, I will go into detail and in depth in a different video, in a short video uh, than this one, so that you'll have a, have a better idea about what I'm talking about. I know if you are new to network engineering, this concept may be a little bit uh, hard to wrap your head around, but for now, just remember these concepts and we'll come back to this later. Data link addresses. Since data link addressing is local addressing it will have a source and a destination for each segment or hop of the journey to the destination mac addressing for the first segment in this example is the source which is pc1 nic the network interface card which sends the frame and the destination the first router or the default gateway interface that which receives the frame for example this guy send that message, it goes to this router and the, the right here, this interface of this router is that destination uh, information coming from. That's where it is coming from. So like it's going from the, the original source into the, you know, the router uh, interface or DGW, which is the default gateway interface, which is this one on this side. The MAC addressing for the second hop, which is this part, is that the source, is, which is the first router, exit interface. So it's not the interface that actually receive on the left-hand side, but the right-hand side, the exit interface. And the destination gonna be the second router, which receive the frame, which is on the left-hand side of that second router. And when it goes finally to the final destination, the source gonna be the second router exit interface, which is this part. And then the, the destination or it would be the web server network interface card, which receives uh, that frame. So just remember every single time it goes through a router, the source and destination keep changing until it's reached the final destination. The main concept here you need to just understand for this beginning introductory course to networking on this particular lecture is to just understand that the source and destination addresses changes in data link uh, layer as it goes through 
these different routers. And also you need to understand how it changes. For example, in this case, it goes from, uh, you know, having these two to these two to these two. So that's what you need to understand. So every single time it goes through a next router, it switches those uh, source and destination uh, addresses. Notice that the packet is not modified, but the frame is changed. Therefore, the layer 3 IP addressing does not change from segment to segment like the layer 2 MAC addressing. The layer 3 addressing remains the same since it is a global and ultimate destination is still the web server. So remember that the IP address, the layer 3 packets during this process, I will go back and quickly show you that. So if we'll go back uh, right here. So what happened is it sends at the beginning, see the IP source IP and the destination IP does not change, just the MAC addresses change. And then when you go to the next one, the source and destination IP is still the same, just the MAC addresses change. And if you go to the next one, again, the source and destination uh, IP addresses on the L3 did not change, it's just the L2 headers have been changed. So that's what this is basically trying to explain. The L3 addressing remains the same since it is a glo it is global and the ultimate destination is still the web server. But however, L2 MAC addressing do change from ch change to, uh, from uh, hop to hop, right? So that that's that's a really uh, important um, concept that you need to understand. L3 IP addresses does not change. L2 MAC addressing does change from one segment to the next segment. Finally, we will look at what we learned as a, just as a summary. This is especially important uh, if you are writing the module quiz or the practice quizzes uh, on your uh, registered Cisco NetAcad exams um, or through your academic institution courses. So what we learn is the rules, which are protocols that must have a sender and a receiver. Common computer protocols include these requirements such as message encoding, formatting, encapsulation, size, timing, and delivery options. Protocols to send a message across the network requires the use of several protocols. Each protocol has its own function, format, and rules for communications. Protocol suits that includes uh, the group of uh, interrelated protocols. I, I, TCP IP protocol suite are the protocols used today for specially communication on the internet. Standardization organizations. Uh, most importantly, what you need to remember is open standard encourage interoperability, competition and innovation. You don't really need to know exact organization structure per se, but you should know what each organization roughly have done in terms of how st uh, the standardization of those uh, networking uh, devices, uh, you know, been done by, you know, by control by those organizations. And uh, finally, uh, the other few things that we learn is would be the uh, reference models, which includes the two models we used to uh, used in networking such as TCP IP and OSI model. The TCP IP model has la four layers and the OSI model has seven layers. For, th for this course, it is very important to understand both models, but the OSI model is more important, I would say, than the TCP IP one. Data exact encapsulation, the form that a piece of data takes at any layer is called the protocol data unit or PDU. And there are five different PDUs used in the data encapsulation process, which are data, segment, packet, frame, and bits. Data access, which is the network uh, and data link layers are going to provide the addressing to move data through the network. Remember that the layer three will provide IP addressing while the layer two provide the MAC addressing. The way these layers handle addressing will depend on whether the source and destination are on the same network or if the destination is on a different network from the source. Remember, 
that when it is on a different network on a source than the source when it's traveled through what happens is that the you know the layer two mac addresses keep changing but the you know layer three ip addresses remain the same from the web server to the uh, client and client to the web server for example and this is the end of the module three as i mentioned before i will try to post some uh, labs as well as supporting materials on my youtube channel so that if you do not have access to the cisco netacad you st still get all the information that you need to study for exams and all the materials you need please subscribe and thumbs up this video and until next time have a nice day